I am confident. I am loved. Jesus made me who I'm supposed to be. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He gives me strength. Fear is not from God. Fear has no control over me. He protects me. He provides my every need. His will is perfect. He has predetermined every step and every breath for me. He died for me. He cries when I cry. He hurts when I hurt. He loves me deeply. I can provide for my family. I am strong. I am able. I am loved. He brings me peace. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And he leads me beside quiet waters. I am courageous. I am safe. I will trust in him always. He is my refuge. He tells me to cast my anxiety on him. He tells me to cast my fears on him. He tells me to cast my weakness on him. He makes me bold. He makes me new. I am like nobody else. And that's what was intended. No one is perfect. No one has it all figured out. Everyone struggles. Everyone battles. Everyone deals with pain. Everyone deals with brokenness. I look out not only for my own interests, but also for others' interests. The Lord has chosen me for himself, and I am his treasure. I forgive others as God has forgiven me. I am thankful and I am loved. A blessed morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to Baraka's Sunday online worship service. We are glad that you are here with us today. Before we start our worship, I just want to share to you a passage taken from Acts 17, 24-25. It says here, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And He is not served by human hands as if He needed anything. Rather, He Himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else you see the god who made the heaven and earth you know the god who is the owner of the entire universe and just to you know uh, add to that the universe actually contains our universe contains more than 200 billion galaxies and imagine that we are in one of the one 200 billion galaxies and inside that galaxy, there is Earth. And inside Earth is you and me. May imagine yung unsa kagamay, you know, out of the 200 billion galaxies that the Lord has made. We are in one galaxy, and inside that galaxy, there are planets, and we are in one of the planets. And inside that planet is Earth, and inside Earth is, what, houses? And inside houses is us. Imagine, I think, you know, I, I believe that in a, in a peck of dust, there's a world inside of a peck of dust. And I believe that peck of dust, in that peck of dust, we are but a peck of dust in that peck of dust. Can you imagine how small we are? And yet it says here, I'm gonna read it again, now we have that in mind. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands. Sa kagamay atong hands. <laughs> right? As if he needed anything. Like, hello. 
He made, imagine how big our God is that He has made 200 billion galaxies. As if He needed anything. But rather, He Himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Even in the, in the uh, sequence of creation, what day was Adam created? On the last day, when everything was prepared for him. God made sure that everything that Adam needed was there. I mean, what kind of God would do that? What kind of God would love us like our God? To add to that, it's another passage taken from Isaiah 40, 25-26. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. You know, the God who takes care of the stars, the billions of stars and galaxies and universe, takes care of us. You know, the, the peck of dust inside a peck of dust. God's love for us is immeasurable. Hello, Gabby. Are you here with me? Like, are you imagining this with me? No, God's God is so great. God is so compassionate. God is so kind. You know, He's so thoughtful. And over that, He's glorious. He's majestic. He's worthy of our praise. And you know, there's no one like Him. He has no equal. He is God and God alone. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for reminding us, Lord God, how, how precious we are in your sight, Father. We thank you, Father, that even though we're just but, you know, dust in this universe, you love us so great that you don't even think of that. Thank you, Father, for taking care of us each day you give us giving us all we need providing for us food shelter and air god thank you lord for the life free life that you have given to us thanks to jesus christ your son thank you lord god for that sacrifice we thank you father we honor and we want to worship you today father in jesus name we pray amen amen You are not a God created by human hands You are not a God dependent on any mortal man You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan That's just the way it is You are not a God created by human hands You are not a God dependent on any mortal man You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan That's just the way it is You are God alone From before time began You are on your throne You are God alone And right now In the good times and bad You are on your throne You are God alone You're the only God whose power none can consent. 
You're the only God whose name, amen, praise will never end. You're the only God who's worthy of anything we can give. You are God, that's just the way it is. You are God alone, from before time began. You are on your throne, you are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone, you are God alone From before time began You are on your throne You are God alone And right now, when the good times and bad You are on your throne You are God alone Unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable, that's what you are. You're unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable, that's what you are. You're unchangeable. Unshakable, you're unstoppable, that's what you are. You're unchangeable, you're unshakable, you're unstoppable, that's what you are. You are God alone from before time began. You are you are God alone And right now In the good times and bad You are on your throne You are God alone You are God alone From before time began You are on your throne You are God alone Good times and bad You are on your throne You are God alone You are God alone From before time began You are on your throne You are God alone And right now In the good times and bad That's what you are You're unchangeable Unshakable You're unstoppable That's what you are You're unchangeable Unshakable Unstoppable That's what you are you are God alone from before time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone.
Beautiful and blessed Sunday to all of you. May the peace of God be upon you and your families as we continue to experience God's faithfulness in the midst of the challenges of our times. Many of us maybe are wondering what's happening in the USA right now because of that controversial election. And uh, of course, the swearing of uh, uh, Joe Biden will take place in January 20. And there are many threats you know, from different parts of uh, people who may become violent because of that inauguration. So we continue to pray for America. I'm sure many American Christians right now who have put their faith in the prophets, the Christian prophets who predicted that Trump will win and be re-elected, uh, seem to have experienced uh, disappointment. And many of them may be living in fear right now. In fact, uh, there are many pastors in America who are uh, encouraging the people not to be afraid but to put their trust in God. Because many of their hopes uh, were not fulfilled because uh, even uh, as we have seen, even Trump himself conceded already to the win of uh, Joe Biden. 
And so all of these things uh, bring questions in the minds of God's people, not only there but also around the world, who have been watching the events unfold in the United States of America. And many are questioning what will be the next step, what will happen after these events. And so we are here as we gather together to worship God. We recognize that God alone remains sovereign over the history of the nations, that the final destiny of the nations, even of America and the rest of the world, is not in the hands of presidents or rulers or kings or even the Senate or Congress of, the Amer of America, but the final destiny of the nation and the nations of the world is held in the hands of God Almighty, the one sovereign God who overrules and rules the nations of the world. And we're going to take a peek at that great reality and truth that is revealed to us through the Word of God as we take a look at the book of Revelation today. This is simply an introduction to the book of Revelation. And we're going to talk about the sovereignty of God and the destiny, the final destiny of the nations. So please join me in reading our scripture for the day. And that's Revelation chapter 5, verse 1 to 10. Let me read from the New International Version. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into, the earth, into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each had a harp, and they were holding golden balls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe, and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. May God bless us as we reflect and meditate on his word. First of all, I would like to share with you the background of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was written during the reign of Emperor Domitian. Emperor Domitian was one of those emperors who reinforced what is called the imperial cults. And that is the belief that the Roman emperor possesses divine authority and is almost recognized as God. In fact, uh, Emperor Domitian was addressed as Dominus et Deus in Latin, which means my Lord and my God, uh, 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 Emperor Domitian. And this imperial cult has become a challenge to Christians who were growing in number under the Roman Empire because it called for total allegiance to the Roman emperor as the one sanctioned by God himself. Of course, uh, the Romans had many gods. And the uh, emperor Domitian himself believed that he was the reincarnation of Hercules, one of the gods. And that is why many people during that time suffered persecution. The Christians suffered uh, severe persecution under emperor Domitian because of his establishment of the, uh, the divine status of the emperor, that is himself, Christianity, because Christians refused to recognize the divinity of the, of the emperor, became a banned religion in the Roman Empire. And Emperor Domitian, because of his desire to try to suppress the spread of the Christian faith in the Roman Empire, took John, who was the last surviving eyewitness apostle of Christ, among the twelve. And he knew that he was the last surviving apostle, who was an eyewitness of Christ himself. And he banished him into the island of Patmos, which during that time was like the Alcatraz of the Roman Empire, a prison island, which is located in the Aegean Sea, just west, uh, west, uh, in the, uh, uh, just off the west coast of modern Turkey today. Turkey during that time was called Asia Minor, and Asia Minor became the cradle 
of Gentile Christianity during the time of the Apostles. And yet this uh, cradle of Gentile Christianity, Turkey, Asia Minor, during that time, now has become fully Muslim. And uh, that is where uh, Emperor Domitian exiled him. And uh, Emperor Domitian did this because he knew that if he killed uh, uh, the Apostle John, the more he will encourage the Christians to be courageous in their spreading of the gospel because the blood of the martyrs, as they said during the time, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And so the more Christians are killed, the more they multiply. And Emperor Domitian, looking back in the history of Roman treatment of the Christians from the time of uh, Nero, Caesar Nero, who preceded him, realized that there's, 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 there's a lot of risk if he killed John the Apostle because that will just embolden the Christians. And so what he did is to stop him from preaching the gospel and from uh, leading the people, uh, those who are fo followers of Christ, and exiled him into the island of Patmos where he can no longer be heard. And it was during that exile in the island of Patmos, the prison island of the Roman Empire, that Jesus Christ came to him and revealed to him the things that are going to come until our time and the near future of our time. Uh, Jesus Christ revealed himself to show that he remains King of kings and Lord of lords even over the Roman Empire. And he gave this revelation to John to encourage his people, the Christians under the Roman Empire, to be courageous and to endure because in the end God Jesus Christ is the one who holds the final destiny not only of the Roman Empire but of all the nations of the world and that is one of the purposes of the book of Revelation is to bring comfort and encouragement to Christians undergoing persecution under the Roman Empire that uh, God Christ is going to vindicate them against their enemies and ultimately he will destroy all the enemies of God and that is particularly for the Christians the Roman Empire itself and so we look at this and begin to understand the, the purposes of biblical prophecy. So I'm going to share with you what is the purpose why God gives us biblical prophecy. And this is these four truths that we're going to take a look at is very true of the book of Revelation. Because all of these are, are uh, expressed very clearly in the, uh, in the unfolding of the events that John saw in his visions now recorded in this book. What are the four purposes of biblical prophecy? Why does God give us prophecy, prophecies of the things to come? Number one, God gives us prophecy of the things to come to, in, to demonstrate his sovereignty, the sovereignty of God, that it is God who determines the future of the world and the final destiny of the nations, not the president, not kings, not rulers, not prime ministers, not even Satan himself or demonic powers, these, these do not have any power or authority to control the destinies of the nations because only God in His sovereignty remains the one in full control not only of the future of the world but the final destiny of all nations. You see, prophecy is not intended to show us that God knows the future. Okay? Prophecy is not intended to show us that God knows the future because, you know, God is not a psychic. Okay? Prophecy is given to us to show us that God determines the future. He is the one who decides what the future will be like. He is the one who, who uh, decrees what the future will be like. And prophecy is the declaration of God's will to be executed in the world and now revealed through the prophets. In other words, prophecy reminds us that God remains in control so that when the prophecies come to pass, we are being reminded that God truly is sovereign because whatever he said come to pass and what he said is what determines what the future will be like. So it's not Satan, it's not the devil. It's not demonic forces that have a say in the final destiny of the nations or the future of the world, but only God. And so biblical prophecy reveals God on the throne, as we will see that, we have seen that in the, in the text that we read, that God sits on the throne, which is the center of authority for the entire universe in heaven and on earth, and that, that God who sits on the throne is giving authority to the Lamb, and we will see that in a while, and He will be given authority to determine and fulfill the will of God, uh, you know, for the destiny of the nations. And so to demonstrate the sovereignty of God is the first purpose of biblical prophecy that God can say in the end when the events take place that he foretold to his prophets, I told you so, I am in control and I am, in, I am sovereign over everything that's happening because I decreed 
that this is going to happen. Amen? And so that's why we can say, because of this tremendous truth, that no matter what happens in the world, no matter what happens to us, we can say, God is in control. And because God is in control, something good is going to happen. And that leads us to the next uh, purpose of biblical prophecy. Biblical prophecy is given to us, secondly, to demonstrate the omnipotence of God, that God is all-powerful because prophecy reveals to us that good and God's purposes will triumph over evil in the end, no matter how evil escalates in the world. Biblical prophecy demonstrates to us that God remains in control and He is all-powerful, that no human resistance no human power can come against his power to accomplish his purposes in the world. That in the end, his good purposes will triumph over evil. Not the decision of human rulers, but the decision of God alone determines the end results that will take place in the nations. And so we recognize that God is all-powerful. That no power on earth can challenge the power of God. And that whatever is happening because it is under the sovereign will of God will reveal his power and he will vindicate himself in the process of allowing evil to, uh, to triumph in the world. He will in the end show that good and his will alone can tri will triumph over evil in the end. Amen? So it demonstrates the omnipotence of God against evil. Thirdly, biblical prophecy is given to demonstrate the justice of God that the sufferings of his people will be vindicated, that evil will be punished, and good will be rewarded in the end. So in the end, there will be justice, even though right now we see there's so much injustice in the world. The biblical prophecy is intended to remind us in the end, God's justice will triumph over all the injustices of the world, and that evil will be punished in the end. So right now, he is allowing evil to take place. Because he is not threatened or limited by evil. In fact, evil plays right into his purposes. Because evil cannot even take place if God did not allow it. And if God allows evil to take place, if he allows Satan to do his work, it's only because it's part of a master plan of God. And that Satan is only a pawn in the purposes of God. No matter what he does, he cannot finally uh, oppose or resist the purposes of God because God's purposes, according to Job, in Job chapter 42, God's purposes can never be thwarted. In the end, God's purpose will stand and Satan will remain defeated. He was already defeated 2,000 years ago and he will suffer even a more major expression of his defeat when the purposes of God in the end will finally be accomplished in the world. Amen? So it, biblical prophecy is intended to demonstrate the justice of God because all evil will always be punished and good will be rewarded in the end. Number four, the fourth purpose of biblical prophecy is to demonstrate the covenant faithfulness of God to his people. That in the end, he will deliver them and save them. And he will vindicate them for all the things they have suffered against the enemies of God. That God in the end will continue to protect, comfort, and, be, uh, and uh, uh, empower his church to be victorious in the midst of suffering. Because he wants to show that he is faithful to his covenant, to his people, and to us. He has established a covenant with us through the blood of Jesus' Son, and He will remain faithful to us up to the end. And so that's why we have nothing to fear. We only need to endure until the end. But because God, who is faithful to His covenant with us, sealed by the blood of Christ, will always be there to uphold us, strengthen us, and enable us to overcome. Amen? So these are the four purposes why God gave us prophecy, and particularly the book of Revelation. Just to give us an idea of the book of Revelation, let me share with you a brief outline of the entire book. So if you do your studies, if ever you want to do that, you understand the structure of the entire book and how, how John uh, arranged the materials, revealing you know, Christ in, in ways we have never even seen before. Okay? Uh, the book of Revelation is divided into three major divisions or sections. Okay? The first section... Uh, uh, is three chapters. The second section is 15 chapters. That is the main bulk of the book of Revelation. And the third section, which is the last uh, four chapters, is only four chapters, okay? So uh, every section of the book of Revelation begins with a vision of Christ, where John sees a fresh vision of Christ appearing to him in a different way in every section of the book. 
So the first vision of Christ in chapter 1 is that he sees Christ appearing to him, you know, in the image of a priest and a judge. And he is being a priest and a judge. He is about to bring encouragement as well as rebuke to his people, the church. And that's the role of the priest. The role of the priest in the, in the, in the, in the, in the temple was to instruct the people in the ways of God, to correct them from the, their wrong ways and to encourage them to remain faithful to God. And Jesus now, as the priest, and the judge, because you know, his, you know, his legs and feet were burnished bronze, and bronze in the Old Testament is a symbol of judgment. That means he, he's a priest. He comes to encourage his people in their relationship with God. But secondly, he also comes to bring judgment to those who are defiant against his will or those who are disobeying him. And so he, he appears in this way as a message to his church. That's why after the vision of chapter 1, chapter 2 and 3 records jesus message to the seven churches of asia minor which contains both exhortation and rebukes okay and this is christ ministering to his church you see uh, jesus christ our lord begins judgment in the church first before he brings judgment to the world and judgment to the world will be described from chapter 4 up to chapter 9, 18 which is the longest part of the, the book of Revelation, which uh, unveils to us the events of the Great Tribulation period when God would unleash His wrath and His judgment against the Antichrist kingdom and against the nations who have allied themselves with the Antichrist. And so the, the judgment of His church begins first, followed after that the judgment of the world. Okay, You see, Christ has to cleanse this church first because it's very hard for Jesus to bring judgment to the world and the world can say why are you judging us even your people behave like us you know what's the difference your people are doing the same thing see Jesus will not allow himself to be humiliated in face of the world by starting judgment with the world before he judges his own people and that is why Christ reveals himself to John and tells him I would like to encourage my people undergoing persecution during this time but I want to let them know that judgment will begin with my people. That I need to cleanse my church so that my church will shine with the brightness of my light into the darkness of this world. The testimony of my church must be uh, cleansed and, and uh, vindicated because that's the only way I can show the world that truly I have brought the light into the world and that they have no excuse for all the evils they will do because I came and my people carry the message uh, of the gospel and translated into their lives as a testimony to the world that the kingdom of God indeed has begun in, on earth through the church. And so Jesus Christ has to begin with his church. Judgment begins with the church of God. And I believe in America today, the things that are going on, the massive persecution that's already beginning to mount against the Christian church and evangelicals is part of the cleansing of God, of the church in America, who have you know, been guilty of so many compromises against God and His Word. And that is why I believe a time of cleansing will take place. And that cleansing during this time of severe persecution will bring revival to the people of God and restore them. There will be repentance uh, and return to God, especially for those who have drifted away from the truths of God's Word and have compromised with the world. I believe that as Christ uh, appears to John, to first rebuke his church, to cleanse his church, and to encourage his church, the events in America today is a manifestation of that work of Christ where judgment begins with the church of God. But what follows after is very exciting for us because the second uh, section of the book of Revelation is the longest one with 15 chapters, begins with another vision of Christ. And here in chapter 4 and 5, he sees God on the throne. And then in chapter 5, he sees Christ as the Lamb who stands on the right hand of God on the throne and receives from the right hand of the Father the scroll with the seven seals that contains the final destiny of the nations of the world. Amen? So here, Christ is being depicted as the victorious warrior. He had to be a Lamb. He had to sacrifice his life to win the battle for his Father against sin and against the works of the devil. By his death, he redeemed all humanity. He paid the price, purchased all humanity for his father, and he paid the price for the sins of the world. And by that doing that, he, he actually uh, shattered the power and the authority of Satan himself. 
He stripped him of his power because by purchasing the nations of the world, every human being on the earth, by paying the redemption price, now Christ has all the rights to every human being on earth because he paid the price for their lives. And because now he has the right of ownership of all humanity, Satan therefore has been stripped of his power because now he has lost his uh he uh, called that his sovereignty over the peoples of the earth because all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus by virtue of his redemptive work on the cross by which he purchased all humanity for his Father. Amen? And that is why Christ is both the Lamb, the one who lays down his life as sacrifice in order to redeem humanity to his Father. But he is also described as the Lion from the tribe of Judah. And the Lion is the symbol of kingship in the Old Testament that he becomes the king because of his sacrifice as the lamb. The lamb represents servanthood, and kingship, of course, represents rulership. That Jesus Christ first had to be the suffering servant who will be slain to pay for all our sins so that he can purchase us back to his father and therefore gain uh, our rights over our lives, gain sovereignty and authority over our lives. Amen? And that now he now rules as the king to carry out the final purposes of God in the world to put all the enemies of God under his feet so that the kingdom of God will once again dominate the earth. That is what is the theme of the second section of the book of Revelation, which is from chapter 4 to 5, which describes the vision that John saw of Christ as the lamb and the lion. And that vision has something to do with the events that will follow, the events that will unfold as the scroll with seven seals are broken. Uh, the seals are broken and the contents of the seal are opened and the instructions, the decrees there are executed in the world. Here the picture is of the Lamb Lion, the champion of God, Jesus Christ, now given authority to, uh, to determine the end of the nations and to execute vengeance against all the enemies of God. Amen? And the last uh, section, which comprises chapter, uh, chapters 19 to 22, we see Jesus appearing to John in a different way again. This time, Jesus comes down from heaven riding on a white horse in order to fight a battle. And we know that's the battle of Armageddon on earth. This is the glorious second coming of Christ. That, that this is the final vision that John sees. And this vision of Christ coming as a victorious warrior prepares us for chapter 20 and up to 22, which tell us the new age to come that will be heralded by the second coming of Christ, when he, he will once and for all time destroy the Antichrist and his false prophet and usher in the reign of Christ on earth, the physical, political reign of Christ on earth that will last for a thousand years. And that will be uh, consummated by the destruction of the present heavens and earth and the creation of a new heavens and earth. And this is what this final section is about. It describes the final victory of the Lamb against all the enemies of God, amen? And that God will, Christ now will usher in the reign of God, the reign of his Father on earth in that 1,000 year years of earthly reign where we as the saints will reign with him for a 1,000 years, amen? It's a beautiful revelation of Christ and brings so much encouragement to his people, reminding us that God remains sovereign over all the events of the earth, amen? Now let us go into some details of this vision in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, we'll be pausing only on chapter 5, the vision of the lamb lion that John sees. This prepares us for the chapters to follow, okay? Christ now executing his authority as the lion from the tribe of Judah to execute vengeance against his father's enemies in the world. And so let's take a look first at the mention of the scroll. What is that scroll? The word of God describes the scroll as having writings both uh, on have all sides, okay? We find that in verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Now let me give you a historical background. In ancient times, uh, contracts were written into scrolls, okay? Or covenants and then sealed with a seal. Those kinds of contracts which contains treaties or, or transactions, agreements, usually only have writing on one side because they're used for public transactions, okay? And so they are sealed. The seal usually bears the, the symbol in the ring of the owner, the one who authorizes that particular uh, transaction agreement or covenant usually has a seal of his ring. In ancient times, 
signatures do not come in, in written form. Signatures to them were carvings, you know, on a ring that is usually impressed on soft clay and placed uh, uh, to seal a particular uh, scroll. The, um, the document is scrolled and then it is sealed so that it cannot be opened until you break the seal. You see, it is soft when the, the ring of the uh, author of, or owner uh, puts the seal there and then it hardens. It hardens so that you have to break it in order to open the scroll. Okay, So there are many scrolls like that. But when the scroll has writings on both sides, it is meant to be a private scroll. It is only for confidential use. In other words, it is not intended for public viewing. So a scroll on both sides in ancient times usually refer to the scroll given by a king to an entrusted executor of his will. Like for example, you know, when uh, uh, the Pharaoh of Egypt, when he uh, elevated Joseph to be prime minister of Egypt or governor of Egypt, he gave uh, Joseph his signet ring, that's the symbol of the king's authority over all the land, so that now uh, uh, jo Joseph can issue decrees on behalf of the king and seal the decrees with the signet ring of the king to show that this decree is authorized by the king himself. Okay, and usually these this, this are documents that are handed over to those who are officials who are given authority to carry out the instructions in that sealed uh, scroll. And these are these instructions that carry out the will of the king. And there are also times when a king, in order to, uh, to, uh, vi uh, to uh, exact vengeance against enemies who threaten his kingdom, he will, he will write his instructions, what will, instructions that must be executed by a commander in the battle. And he, this, this scroll will be sealed with many seals, meaning this is of utmost highest authority because this is coming from the king himself. The more seals on the scroll, the more authority it manifests. Okay, So this, this scroll contains writings on both sides because it contains so many uh, instructions of the king by which he wants his enemies to experience his vengeance. Okay, And this is entrusted to a champion. Usually, a, a commander in the, ba in, in, in the army of the king who has proven his worth as being a, vic a victorious warrior in his past battles. He must prove himself as worthy to carry out these instructions because these are important to the king and must be executed to the final letter so that the will of the king will be carried out and the enemies of the king will completely be destroyed. And this is entrusted only to a champion, one who has proven himself victorious. One who has proven himself capable and qualified to execute the will of the king because the king has confidence that he will definitely finish the job, that he will not fail in any way, but he will succeed in what the king wants to accomplish. That is the background behind the scroll. And we see the same scroll with writings on both sides, uh, also mentioned of the scroll that God gave to, uh, to uh, the prophet Ezekiel we will take a look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, as we look at the scroll that God gave to Ezekiel. So Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9, Then I looked, and I saw a hand stretched out to me, and, it and in it was a scroll, which he unrolled before me. On both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. Chapter 3, verse 1, And he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll, then go and speak to the people of Israel. So God gives uh, uh, Ezekiel the scroll with writings on both sides, which, con which contains the judgments of God against his people Israel. That's why uh, Ezekiel described the scroll as of, of written words of lament and mourning and woe because it contains the judgments of God against Israel to exact vengeance against the enemies of God, his own people who became traitor against his covenant with them. And so this is an example of a scroll that's supposed to be executed. And Ezekiel was commanded to eat the scroll because it has to be spoken to the people. In other words, the aim is that you eat the scroll and speak it out, tell them my judgment that I'm about to bring to them as a nation. And so this is the background of the scroll with writings on both sides, usually coming from a king handed to a champion that will execute, execute its contents because the king has confident that this uh, champion has qualified himself
to be victorious in what he is about to do on behalf of the king. And so that is the meaning of the scroll. And the fact that it comes from the right hand of God the king on the throne, it means that it carries the authority of God Almighty himself. That's why it is a scroll with seven seals. And seven is the number of God in the book of Revelation. It's the number of perfection or completion. And so seven means this carries all the authority of God Almighty. Amen? And so this scroll was, was given only to one who was qualified, and that was the Lamb. And why was the Lamb worthy? The Lamb was worthy because according to Revelation, the same chapter, verse 9 to 10, when he, Jesus received the scroll, all the, you know, the four living creatures and the 24 elders bowed down and worshipped him, and they sang a new song saying, this is Revelation 5, verse 9 to 10. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. This is the reason why you're worthy. Because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Now listen to this. Usually a champion is proven by his victory in battles. And of course the champion proves himself victorious because he remains alive and the enemies are all put to death. But it's very interesting here that Christ being depicted as the champion of God, as the victorious warrior, is said to be worthy, is said to be God's champion because he was slain. Now isn't that very ironic? Okay? Champions are people who survive the battlefield and win the war. Amen? They, they live, they're alive, they are not dead because their being alive means that they are victorious. Amen? But interestingly here, the qualification of the champion who is to, to execute the vengeance of God against his enemies, written in that scroll with the seven seals, was slain. Okay? But look at the, what follows next. Because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Now we know that Satan, the moment Christ came to earth, Satan saw him as a threat to his kingdom. And even from the time that he was born, he was threatened by the devil. He used Herod to execute, you know, all the children in Bethlehem in suspicion that one of them was Jesus. But we know that God sent an angel to Joseph and Mary to tell them to flee to Egypt so that Jesus' life will be spared. So even in, during his birth, Jesus was threatened by the devil himself. You know why? Because Jesus was the one sent by God to bring back to the Father all the peoples of the earth that fell under the dominion of the devil. That's why when Jesus was tempted in the, in the mountain, Satan showed him all the kingdoms of this world. He said, this belong to me. These are all mine, for they have been handed over to me, and I gave them whomever I wish. Now I know you came here, Jesus, to bring back all these kingdoms to your Father. And I'm going to give you a deal. I give you back all humanity, all the kingdoms of the world, and all their splendor. If you only do one thing, bow down and worship me. You know, Satan was correct in, his, in believing that Jesus came to redeem the world back to his father and to claim all these kingdoms back to his father because all of these nations fell under the dominion of Satan because of sin, their sin and their rebellion against God. In fact, that was Jesus' mission. We see in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, what was the true mission of Christ when he came to earth? Uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 1, 9 to 10, He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good intent, pleasure, to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, and the time of fulfillment has now begun in the first coming of Christ, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. You see, earth became a rebel planet. The peoples of the earth, starting from Adam, rebelled against God and refused to bow down to his rule. That's why we could say that earth is a rebel planet. And Jesus Christ came to bring unity to the universe. And of course, the primary uh, object for restoration is humanity, mankind, who have rebelled against God. But also, of course, restore unity by vanquishing the enemy of God, which is Satan. Because Satan is the one who rules now the world in their rebellion against God. And so this uh, cosmic battle, this cosmic war, was intended to be won by Christ 
so that he establishes unity again in the universe. Where earth again, humanity will be reconciled with God and Satan and all his demons will finally be vanquished, okay? So that unity can be restored. This was the purpose why Jesus came. And Satan already suspected that. Because why would Jesus come? Why would the Son of God come to earth? Since Jesus represented the rule of his Father in the universe. Except to bring back the world back to his Father. And so he's saying, I'll give you the easy way to get them. Just worship me. I am the God of this world. Now you are in my territory. I want you to bow down and recognize I am God of To which Jesus responded, of course, in the Gospels. It is written, You shall worship the Lord thy God alone, and him alone shall you serve. Begone, Satan. You understand this? Satan never knew that Jesus were going, was going to accomplish that goal of bringing back all humanity back to his Father through his death on the cross. Hallelujah. By being slain. Now listen to this. Satan may be intelligent, but he doesn't know everything. Satan may be intelligent, but he is not wise. You understand that? There's a difference between being subtle, being cunning, being clever, and being truly wise from God's standards. He never understood that was coming. And so he was the one not only who engineered the massacre of the innocents in the hope that he would include Christ uh, to be killed after he was born through Herod the Great, but even in the final moments of Christ, it was Satan who engineered his death on the cross. In fact, we find in Luke 22 verse 3, as it is written, Then Satan entered into Judas, is called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. We find also in John 13, 27, Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, that's Judas, and Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do it quickly. Satan entered the Judas, which means that Satan was the one who engineered, orchestrated the arrest of Christ through Judas and his ultimate death on the cross. He thought by getting rid of Christ, Christ could never exert his role on the earth. He did not know that Jesus was fighting a different battle at a different level. Okay? He thought that the opposition of Christ against his kingdom will come in a forceful manner. That's why he had to have him killed. He did not know that it is true weakness, the weakness of death, the weakness of the crucifixion, that he was about to undo the power of the devil over the world. That's the wisdom of God. Amen? That's why the cross of God, the cross of Christ is wisdom for God, but foolishness to the world, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And that is why in John 14, verse 30 to 31, just before Jesus Christ was about to die, he said this uh, to his disciples. Oh, I'll start with John 12, verse 31. He spoke this before the Last Supper. He said in John 12, 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. In other words, what will happen after that night will lead to the casting out of the ruler of this world from his sphere of authority, that he will be stripped of his authority. Satan heard this. Satan heard these words. This was prior to the Last Supper. And it was this verse, I believe, that prompted Saint to enter into Jesus to kill Jesus. Because he will never allow Jesus to take his kingdom away from him. He never understood that his plan to have Christ killed was playing right into the purposes of God. Amen? Now, that's why there's nothing that you need to be afraid about Satan's work in the world. Let me tell you this. We are never commanded by the word of God to pray against demonic forces. We are commanded to pray for people because in the end, people are the ones who make the decisions, not demonic powers. Demonic powers will give suggestions into their minds. Demonic powers can deceive them, but ultimately, it is the decision of human beings whether they will you know, carry out the deception whether they will agree to the temptation or to the thoughts being planted in their mind, ultimately, man is held responsible for whatever he does. That is why in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and following, we are commanded by Scripture to pray for all men. Okay? Uh, chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, verse 1, I urge that first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all men, all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and, 
and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. That, that we'll be able to live holy lives. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men, all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You see, we're called to pray for people, not pray against demonic forces because no matter what uh, prayer you pray against demonic forces, if human beings, people, agree and allow themselves to be deceived because they did not love the truth so as to discern truth or error, then they become responsible for the things that they do. We cannot blame Satan for the dis human decisions because in that God will hold human beings accountable for the decisions they make wherever the suggestions came from. It's still people who make decisions. That's why we're called to pray for people. You understand this? Now, I'm not against spiritual warfare. I'm not against, you know, uh, uh, teaching that we are struggle against flesh, not against flesh and blood, but against principles and powers. That's true. But the struggle there is the experience of Paul in enduring persecution, recognizing that Satan is trying to hinder him and his work, but he endured through it. But you never hear Paul, you know, speaking against the devil, stop attacking me or stop hindering my kingdom. He never, you never hear Paul declaring things or praying against the devil. He's always praying for people, always asking prayer for himself, because in the end, the events of the world are determined not by Satan or demonic forces. The events of the world are determined by human decisions. You understand this? That's why we're called to pray for all people. Amen? And so let me share this with you. Satan may have entered into Judas, but Judas still had the final say. That's why Jesus held him accountable and called him in John 17 the son of perdition or the son doomed to destruction because he will be judged by God for what he did in betraying Christ. Even though Satan was behind it, he held Judas fully accountable. Do you understand this? Okay? I said I'm not against spiritual warfare because spiritual warfare is taught in the Bible, but nowhere in the Bible is it taught that we pray against demonic forces. No. We're always called to pray for human beings because they're the ones who make the decisions in this world. Satan can only suggest. Satan, yes, can deceive. Satan can, can give ideas, but the final decision belongs to human beings. And they are deceived because they refuse to love the truth so as to be saved. We find this in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 and 12. And let me read this for you. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and the, and the ways and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie so that all will be condemned who have not believed, who have not believed in the truth but have delighted in wickedness. In other words, you know, the the, the reason why human beings should be held accountable by God and not the devil is because the devil may deceive them, but they are the ones who become deceived by choice because they refuse to believe in the truths of God. That's why God holds them responsible for being deceived because they made a decision to reject the truths of God and that's why they fell into the deception of the devil. So in the end, you cannot blame Satan for the deceptions that take place you know, you know, in human beings or leaders in leaders of nations. Why? Because it is still human beings that God holds responsible for their decisions to reject or accept the truths of God that will enable them to discern what is truth and what is not truth. And so deception may be the work of the devil, but the ultimate decision still rests on human beings. And therefore, we need to pray for all people, for those in authority, for President Joe Biden in America, for, Pres uh, for President Trump, we have to pray for them because they are the ones who make the decisions, the effect that uh, have effect on the uh, des destiny of their own nations. Those these decisions that they make, we need to pray that God will turn their hearts towards God so that they will follow God's agenda. That leaders in the world, the Senate, Congress, you know, prime ministers in the world, their hearts will be turned to God so they will follow the will of God. Okay, no matter what Satan does to try to deceive them. If they know the truth of God and are loyal to the truth of God, Satan cannot prevail because in the end, it's human decision that determines what happens in the world. Amen? And so let's pray for people, for those in authority, for all human beings. And so Satan was behind the crucifixion of Christ, but he did not realize that the death of Christ will be the price 
that was going to be paid so that all human beings that was under his dominion will now be given to Christ as his rightful inheritance because he paid the price for the salvation of every human being on the earth. In other words, after Christ rose from the dead, victorious in that battle by which he vanquished the enemy, proving himself the champion of God because he was slain. And by being slain, he was able to strip the devil of all his power and authority because now all humanity belongs to Christ by right, by right of his shed blood. Satan no longer has full rights of holding human beings under him because Christ has redeemed them all. Amen? You see, you are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals because you're the champion. You were slain and you purchased for yourself men from every tribe and people and language and nation. Amen? Hallelujah. And so, that's why that's where the Great Commission is based. You know, the Great Commission is often not fully understood because you usually only quote verse 19 and 20. When verse 18 is part of the Great Commission, and as we include verse 18, we will see the, the, the bigger picture behind the Great Commission. So let's take a look at Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That was the cry of victory. Amen? Before Satan was the ruler of this world. Before Satan was the ruler also of the powers of the air. So both the, in the heavens and the earth were being... Uh, ruled by the devil of course there are principalities and powers these are high-ranking uh angels under lucifer who are governing the heavenly places okay and uh, from there their vantage point of controlling the events on the earth from the heavenly realms but now all authority in heaven where demonic principalities and powers are operating authority there has been given to christ and all human authority that is authority of human beings on earth has now been transferred to christ because by his by virtue of his shed blood now he has gained the rights to claim every human being back to his father because he redeemed them by his sacrifice on the cross amen and so all authority in heaven has been given to me. And because now I have been given authority, I want you to go and claim the nations for me because I have, no, I have all the rights now to claim them for myself because I purchased them with my blood. And that is why the Great Commission will become even more understood than you recognize. Sharing the gospel, evangelism, is the act of claiming what rightfully belongs to the Lamb. Every human being on earth, by right, now belongs to Christ because he purchased them with his blood. You understand this? That is the victory that Christ uh, gained on the cross. That's why he is the champion of God because he was slain and purchased all humanity back to his Father. And there was the right to claim what belongs to him because of what he has done. Amen? Every time you share the gospel, you are not fighting for victory. You are fighting from victory. Repeat that. Every time you share the gospel, you're engaged in a spiritual battle to bring back king people from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of Christ. It's a battle. But remember this. It is a battle that's already been won. Amen? We are fighting from victory, not fighting for victory. Because victory was already won by Christ on the cross of Calvary. Amen? He has a right to claim your relative who does not know Christ. He has the right to claim your enemies whom you hate because they're persecuting you. Maybe you don't like them, but Christ has a right to claim them for his own because of his shed blood. This is how Jesus won the battle. And that's why, you know, it is said that he is the one worthy to open the scroll and its seals because that contains the, the, uh, the marching orders of the king to execute vengeance against his enemies. And only Jesus is qualified to do that because he earned the right because all humanity was purchased by his blood and now he has the right to do the will of his God to, on all humanity. All the nations of the earth, he has the right to execute the will of his Father. Amen? Now you understand why he was worthy as the scroll. And what are all these things telling us? Jesus Christ reigns in America. Jesus Christ reigns over this pandemic. Jesus Christ reigns over the Philippines. Jesus Christ reigns over all the nations of the world. And whatever is happening to the end of the world is executing the will of his Father. Do you understand this? We find in Ephesians, uh, sorry, in 1 Corinthians, this uh, wonderful truth, chapter 15, verse 24 to 28. 
Then the end will come when Jesus hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, that is all authority on earth that is opposed against God, all authority in heaven that is opposed against God. These are demonic powers. So he will, he will hand over the kingdom uh, over which he has exerted, exerted rule, the kingdom of Christ, which are all believers around the world, this kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power opposed to God. For he must reign, Jesus must reign, until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And when he has put all his enemies under his feet, he will now submit the kingdom back to his Father. Because by vanquishing all the enemies of God his Father, there will be unity again in the universe. He will reconcile the earth back to his Father, and all the heavens will be reconciled to God, because all these demonic rulers and principalities will be vanquished by Christ himself. Amen? And so he will bring unity back to the universe, as we have seen in Ephesians chapter 1. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death, because death is the final manifestation of sin because death is the penalty of sin in other words christ is saying the purpose of christ is to allow life to reign over death because death no longer has the final say in the kingdom of christ the final say in the kingdom of christ is life that comes from christ himself amen the last enemy to be destroyed is death because it's the greatest physical threat to all human beings even that enemy will be vanquished amen for he has put everything under his feet. God has put everything under the foot of Jesus. This is a quotation from the Old Testament. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, Christ, it is clear that this does not include God himself. Of course, Paul is saying, wakayang maging philosopho, hindi kasama ang Diyos doon. Say everything will be placed under the feet of Christ. This does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, when Christ has done this, he has vanquished all the enemies of God, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. See, that's the role of the champion in the battlefield. After the champion defeats all the enemies of the king and brings back order in the kingdom because all those who threat the order of the king has been destroyed by the champion, now he will submit everything back to the king so that the king who commissioned him will have full authority again in a kingdom that has been brought back to its proper order, a kingdom that has been restored because of the victory of the champion. Do you understand this? This is the picture of Christ in the book of Revelation. And that's why, let me just encourage you today. Do not be alarmed too much about the events that's taking place around the world, the evil things that are happening right now even in America, in all other countries in the world. Remember this. Prophecy reminds us that Jesus reigns. Amen? That Jesus holds in his hands the destiny of the nations. The scroll contains the judgments that will be poured out against the enemies of God in order to bring order back to his kingdom in heaven and on earth and reconcile the earth back to his Father. And Christ will reign on earth for a thousand years. And we will reign with him in a kingdom that will be marked by justice and peace under Christ himself. That's when the kingdom of God has now become the kingdom of man. When the kingdom of God now will rule over all humanity during the millennial period after the second coming of Christ. That is the bright future that we all share as believers in Christ. Amen? So, what is our part? Our part is to continue to share the gospel because Christ wants us to claim what belongs to him by right of his shed blood. He wants all the nations to hear the gospel. Amen? That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, the gospel of this kingdom will be preached into the whole world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. In other words, God, Jesus cannot execute the final judgments of God on the earth until every nation has heard the gospel to give them an opportunity to repent and turn to Christ for their salvation. Amen? Christ is the champion who has gone ahead to destroy our enemies so that we can be assured of our salvation and the salvation of those who will come to Christ. So preach the gospel because you know that all authority now belongs to Christ. And the, and the preaching of the gospel demonstrates the rule of Christ coming into the lives of the people that you are sharing the gospel with. It is his right to bring them under his rule because of what he has done. Amen. Secondly, to pray for America. Pray for what's going on there. Pray for the Christian church in America. Pray for the Christian church all over the world who are suffering persecution right now. 
pray for the salvation of kings and rulers. That's why we exhorted in First Timothy chapter 2, all kinds of petitions, prayers, and intercession be made with thanksgiving, which is we pray in faith. With thanksgiving means that God wants us to pray in faith that when we say, God, touch the heart of this king, touch the heart of these rulers, we expect God to move and we say, thank you, Lord. All prayers must be with thanksgiving for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. There will be no peace, especially for the Church of America, if the king's heart is not right with God. If the heart of President Joe Biden will not be reconciled with God, there will be no peace for the Christian church. We need to pray so that there will be peace, so we can live peacefully and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. That's what God wants for his people. So we can live holy lives. Let's pray for those in authority. Amen? This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And that reveals to us what is the subject of our prayer for all people. This is saying to us that the subject of our prayer is to pray for their salvation. Amen? So let's not pray, you know, to express our loyalty for certain people. Remember, God doesn't want us to put our trust in flesh, but in God alone. Amen? Remember, the final destiny of the nations is in the hands of the Lamb who holds the scroll with the seven seals, not in the hands of these presidents or kings. That's why we need to pray that God will move to touch their hearts so they will turn to God. Amen? For nothing is impossible with God. And we pray for the salvation of those in authority. And for all people, we are praying according to the will of God. Because this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen? And thirdly, to stop worrying and living in fear. Because God has already defeated the enemies, his enemies, through Jesus Christ. Once and for all in the cross, that one for Christ, the rights, to all the kingdoms of the world. Amen? But we know that in the end, because this is what biblical prophecy intended to show us, the sovereignty of God, the justice of God, the omnipotence of God, and God's covenant faithfulness will be revealed to us, His people. In other words, everything that God is going to do to the world will be on our behalf to exact vengeance for us against the enemies of God and to finally bring us to the fullness of our salvation when during the resurrection when we will be given a glorified body so that we can reign with christ on earth for a thousand years in that new body that we will receive amen so take heart as jesus said in the world you will have tribulation i have said these things to you that in me you will have peace in the world you'll have tribulation but take courage i have already overcome the world amen may god bless us as we reflect on this and allow the voice of God to continue to be strong in our hearts as we continue to preach the gospel. Pray for the leaders of nations. Pray for the churches. Pray uh, for the, those who are making decisions that will affect nations. Pray for them. And thirdly, do not live in fear, but always declare the sovereignty of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, today you are blessed to receive an inspiring and life-changing message through God's Word. So for our tithes and offering, let me read for you 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 to 11. It says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Indeed, Paul encourages us to give generously because God will enlarge the storehouse of your righteousness and you will be enriched in every way. So this time, let's give our best. But before doing so, let me pray for you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, 
that you are the source of everything. Today, God, as we give our best, let this tithes and offering honor your name and let our lives be pleasing to you. We thank you for everything that you have done. Thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can securely give through the account posted in your screen. You are blessed. Uh, stay safe and be healthy. Shalom. pray and receive the blessing. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the worship online. Thank you for speaking to us through prayers, through songs of worship, and even through the message. May your people receive uh, your goodness. May they experience your goodness, receive your blessings today. And even this week, we pray that, Lord, we will seek satisfaction in you alone and that we will seek your glory and your own honor, Father. In individually and in our family. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom now and forevermore. Amen. kids and welcome to the year of God's favor yes any year is always God's favor we always find his favor of peace joy you know provisions and we are in the past years maybe 1960s maybe where you find this old stuff around you okay maybe some of you were not born yet when these things existed, right? Yes, I was born 1965, so I have, I have, you know, was able to find these things when I was a kid yet. Okay, so are you ready for the story? Yes, it's about the great problem. Yes, well, if you have a problem, if you use this, you know, iron here, to iron your clothes because you still need to find some carbon or or you know the charcoal to put you know heat there while in the modern age we already can use the you know the flat iron where you just insert it there in the plug electric plug and then you can you can do it very very quick unlike before it still needs time yes it's always time for everything okay there's always time to, to to prepare ourselves there's always time to repent from our sins right and so what do you think is the great problem that is happening around the world maybe you may think about man's greed yes they're so greedy about greedy about power they're so greedy about you know having lots of money right maybe maybe some sin of committing things that is not pleasing to god right now the story is about the great problem but kids always remember in every problem is always a solution and listen to what the problem and the solution that our storytellers gonna say today and let's welcome teacher Christine Visitation! Yay! The Greatest Problem What are some of the choices you have had to make? Do you ever make bad choices? In this story, the first people, Adam and Eve, faced a choice. 
Will they listen to God and obey Him? Let's read Genesis chapter 2 to 3. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God caused him to fall into a deep sleep. He made the woman from the man so that they would both be in God's image. They were named Adam and Eve. Satan, God's enemy, disguised as a serpent, wanted to deceive Adam and Eve. The serpent said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit of any tree that is in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We can eat the fruit of the trees that are in the garden, but God did say you must not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Do not even touch it. If you do, you will die. You can be sure that you won't die, the serpent said to the woman. God knows that when you eat the fruit of the tree, you will know things you have never known before. You will be able to tell the difference between good and evil. You will be like God. Eve wanted to know everything God knows. She and Adam both eat the fruit. Suddenly, they were ashamed and hid from God. God found them and asked, Have you eaten the fruit of the tree I commanded you not to eat? The man said, It was the woman you put here with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What have you done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me. That's why I ate the fruit. God cursed the serpent and punished the woman and the man. The woman would have painful childbearing and it would be difficult for the man to work the land for food. They would eventually die and return to the dust they were made from. The Lord God said, The man has become like one of us. He can now tell the difference between good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and pick fruit from the tree of life and eat it. If he does, he will live forever. So the Lord God drove the man out of the Garden of Eden. Our greatest problem is sin. So what is sin? It is anything we do say, or even think that is wrong and against God's way. The Bible teaches us that we all sin. Sin separates us from God. It has the awful power to destroy lives and mess up what God created. God takes sin seriously because sin is terrible and God is completely good. The punishment for sin is death and to be separated from God and everything good forever. Remember, everybody sins. Sin stops us from knowing God and following Him. God loves us even though we sin. We cannot solve our sin problem without God. Chapter 6, verse 23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord.
you have learned about the great problem that's happening around the world. And as the story, we also found we also found out that there is a great solution. Yes, if the problem is sin, then the solution is Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you and for me. Yes, thank you guys that you have learned something. And for the little ones who just said the memory verses, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being part of our Sunday school to reach out people, to reach out children like you. Thank you so much, kids. Again, every year is God's favor. Seek Him and you will find that favor. Okay, always remember that Jesus loves you. We are Noel here saying, Bye-bye.